Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about the common based amplifier by building and testing out such a circuit. I will be working with the component values we designed last time, so make sure to see that episode first. As always, it's important to verify the simulation results, because just because it looks good in the simulator does not mean the practical circuit will be identical. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So the circuit to be tested today is a single supply common base amplifier built around the BC547C transistor. This is not a particularly high frequency transistor, but as the simulator has shown, the performance that you get out of your circuit is highly dependent on how exactly you use the components. So the circuit that we will be using today is the one that we ran the most simulations on last time. So it's a common base amplifier built around the BC547C and this has a base network comprised of an 180 kilo ohm resistor and a 39 kilo ohm resistor which is stabilized by a 1 microfarad capacitor and then the transistor has a 2 kilo ohm resistor in the emitter and a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor in the collector and the signal is connected through a couple SMA connectors AC coupled through 22 microfarad capacitors. Now this schematic again has a bunch of unplaced components and that's simply because I'm using the same general board layout for multiple circuits. And well, other than the components mentioned, I also have the supply connector and a couple of decoupling capacitors. The complete board is quite a small 5x5cm design with both input and output connections, this time on the same side. And all of the components are through hole. First thing to do is of course to check the DC operating point of the circuit. So to verify the collector emitter voltage and the collector current. Now with this particular application this is especially important because the input impedance is directly related to the emitter current. So to verify this I prepared the setup here in which I have my circuit supplied through an amp meter from a 10 volt power supply and for the various voltage measurements I will be using a voltmeter. So if we turn on the power supply we can see that the complete circuit is drawing about 598 microamps, most of this being in the collector current, and we can now proceed to verify the various voltages. So first off, we can see that our collector emitter voltage is 6.22 volts, and secondly, we can see that the voltage drop on our collector resistor is 2.56. So knowing this value, and knowing that the collector resistor is 4.7 kilo ohms, we can exactly calculate the collector current. So in general, the circuit is behaving close to what we were getting from the simulation. Next, we can have a look at the signals that pass through the amplifier. And for that, I prepared this other setup in which my amplifier is connected on the input side to the signal generator. And I'm also monitoring this line using the yellow channel of the oscilloscope. And then on the output, I have a five kilo ohm load and I'm also monitoring the output using the blue channel of the oscilloscope. So if we turn on the signal generator, starting off with a very small signal, so we can see our input signal is 1.1 millivolts peak to peak, we can clearly see the voltage gain of the amplifier, so the output signal is 500 millivolts peak to peak, and we can also see that the two signals are in phase, so this is a non-inverting amplifier. Now if we start increasing our input signal, so 4 millivolts of input signal, 10 millivolts, everything still looks pretty good. At some point though, so right now we have a 42 millivolt input signal, the output starts to look a bit distorted. Now analyzing the output waveform by eye isn't the most scientific method. So the next best thing to figure out when the amplifier starts to distort signals is to use an FFT analysis on the output signal. So most oscilloscopes have this math function built into them. So I set up the oscilloscope to analyze the blue trace and plot out the FFT spectrum of it. So we can clearly see our main spike at 10 kilohertz and then the first harmonic, which should appear at about 20 kilohertz, isn't really visible. So this is with the one millivolt input signal. However, 
if we start to increase now the input signal, at some point, the harmonics start to increase. So with a 6 millivolt input signal, we can already see very clearly our first harmonic. And while the larger the input signal, so right now it's at 30 millivolts, the more harmonics that start to appear. Now, the exact amount of distortion that is acceptable for your application is application dependent. So this might be a problem or it might not be a problem. And of course, you can partially fix this by adding filters on the output. But anyway, we have a bit of a problem with this amplifier. Distortion started appearing when the input signal went above 5 to 10 millivolts. So in order to keep it in its nice linear region, we need to inject very small signals into the amplifier. Anything higher will drive it into a non-linear region. Now, to observe the gain of the amplifier, specifically the voltage gain, you can't just use any piece of equipment. After all, we expect the unity point to be at quite high frequency levels. So running the oscilloscope and signal generator combo in Bode plot mode won't do. Not for me at least, since my generator is limited to 60 MHz. So this needs to be verified with either a network analyzer or a spectrum analyzer, something that has sufficient bandwidth. With this sort of equipment, However, you still need to take into consideration the impedance mismatch, if there is any. Now, for our particular circuit, the input is supposed to be 50 ohms, or at least that was the design goal, but the output is in the kilo ohm range. So here, we can't just connect this to a 50 ohm measuring equipment, we need to use some sort of impedance matching. Now, one thing you could do is use a matching transformer that has an inductance ratio of 1 to 100, so to transform the 5 kilo ohms to 50 ohms, and this would be a very nice wideband and lossless matching technique. However, specifically for the case of just performing a measurement, losses are not really an issue as long as we are taking them into account. So the easier way of doing things is to use a resistor-based matching circuit that will take the 5 kilo ohms into our 50 ohm port. So I will be using a resistor divider that has a 5 kilo ohm and a 50 ohm resistor in it and connect this to a 50 ohm load. In effect, this will create a 1 to 200 attenuation. And we can confirm this by comparing the results that we're getting into this load compared to our initial result. So the difference between the two levels is 46 decibels. So in essence, we can use this resistor divider run it into a 50 ohm port, and whatever we are measuring, we simply add this 46 decibels, and that will be the result into a 5 kilo ohm load. So to perform the measurement on voltage gain, I will be using a spectrum analyzer, and this is a nice tool for the job, as long as it has a tracking generator output. Now this will be able to give you the ratio of input to output voltage, however, it will not be able to give you any information on the phase shift caused by the amplifier. So for that you would need a network analyzer. Regardless, I will be using this tool and I already configured it so that the tracking generator output is going through some attenuation, so 20 decibels, just to reduce the amplitude as much as possible. And then this is fed back into the instrument and normalized. Now since we have about 46 decibels of attenuation coming from our output resistors, I set it up so that without the circuit, it's at a level of 46 decibels. So whatever value we will be getting when the amplifier is connected, that is the gain of the amplifier. So let's connect it and see what happens. So we can see a rather similar trace to what we were getting in the simulator. We have a flat response and then it starts to drop down. But at high frequencies, so this third marker is at 100 MHz, then the gain starts to rise again. Now, this is not really coming from the amplification of the amplifier, but rather from the layout and the components on the board. So some of the input signal is coupling directly into the output because of the placement that I used. Regardless, we can see at relatively low frequencies that we do get our 32 decibels of gain. So this is very close to what we got in the circuit simulator. Last thing to do is check some network parameters. 
Last time some of you made some very important points about my measurement method. So first off, to perform a small signal measurement, you need small signals. So it's important to check the output of the network analyzer and use the smallest signal possible while still being able to get useful data. If the injected signal into the circuit is too large in amplitude, it can lead to false results because the amplifier will no longer be in its linear region. The other point was regarding the output impedance measurement method. One common way of performing this is to apply a signal on the amplifier input and observe the signal at the amplifier output when it runs into different loads. The more accurate version of this is to use two loads close to the expected output impedance. And then the amplifier's output impedance can be calculated using this formula. But you can simplify the measurement by using one actual load and an open circuit measurement. So V out one is the case when there is no output load. Now the method that I used last time was to keep the input with no signal so that the amplifier output should stay at zero volts. But then if you inject a signal from the output side, you can observe the amount by which the circuit withstands this change. And from this, you could calculate the output impedance. Now, from a network analysis point of view, a two port circuit has no input and output. It's just port one and port two. To an extent, both ports are bidirectional. So the ports should not be treated differently based on the circuit, as long as the injected test signal is small enough to not get distorted, and the other port is connected to the correct value of termination. In essence, both measurement methods should give the exact same results. But just to confirm, I'll look into this in more detail some other time. However, with today's amplifier, the measurement signals need to be so small that I can't really use my blight VNA. The initial output signal is in the 200 millivolt region, which is way too much for our amplifier. And if you attenuate the measurement signal sufficiently to not get distorted using various attenuators, the measurement results becomes too noisy. So we need to measure using the other method. For this, I will be using the signal generator and oscilloscope combination, because this way I can generate the very small input signals needed to keep the amplifier in its small signal region. So I will be using the signal generator in outputting one millivolt, anything lower and the noise is just too much to be able to measure it. And to start measuring, so starting with the input impedance, first we need to confirm the output impedance of the signal generator. So for that, first of all, I will be measuring the exact signal that is coming out of the generator. And to get a nice and clean signal, I'm using a average acquisition. So the oscilloscope is taking 16 measurements and averaging them out. And this gives us a RMS value of 711 microvolts. Next, we need to see what signal ends up into a 50 ohm termination. So we know that this is exactly 50 ohms. And if we put this in the path of our signal, we can see that we have a smaller signal this time at around 361 microvolts. So from this, we can determine that the output impedance of the generator is about 48 ohms. Now, knowing this value, we can now see the signal attenuation when the amplifier is connected. So now we know the output signal, we know the output impedance, and when we connect the unknown load of the amplifier, we can see that we are getting about 348 microvolts. And from this, we can work out that the input impedance of the amplifier is about 46 ohms. So it's a bit higher than what we were expecting from the calculations, but it's close enough. And next, for the output impedance, we can take a similar approach so first of all, the input signal is still being injected into the input port of the amplifier. And now we can measure the output of the amplifier in a no load condition and in a loaded condition. So I have my five kilo ohm load, which is not connected at the moment. And if we turn on the signal generator, we can see that the output is about 32.85 millivolts RMS when there is no load. And then when we connect our five kilo ohm load, this goes down to 17.14. So from these two values, we can determine the output impedance to be about 4.6 kilo ohms. Now, we could make a more accurate measurement if we had two different load values, but for today, this method will also do. 
Now, it's important to point out that this measurement was carried out at 10 kHz. To get the full picture, you need to perform this measurement at multiple frequency values. So to get the frequency behavior of the amplifier. And as frequencies increase, it's important to take into account that the loads are complex. So a certain phase shift will occur. Therefore, it will be important to take that also into account. So the formulas and the mathematics are the same, it's just that the various values need to be treated as complex numbers. In the end, the common base amplifier offers a set of properties which can become extremely useful under special situations. But as with any circuit, the exact implementation will impact the overall performance. The simulated circuit assumes an ideal construction, but the practical build usually adds various parasitics which become more and more significant as frequency increases. So especially with high frequency circuits, practical verification is crucial. The common base amplifier is no exception to this rule. And with that said, hope you got some useful information after this, leave it us in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date to this videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.